Check, check, check it. It's a unique hustle. It's your boy ECO, and I'm here with the lovely, amazing, official Miss Jamaica. What's going on? Not, not, not. You know, my day walk on. Man, hold, hold on. Before you get into that, I hold gotta up. tell our audience <laughs> to make sure to like, subscribe, follow us on all social media platforms. You know, we on that TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, you name it, we on it. But the most important one right now is to go ahead and join our Patreon channel. That's the only place you're gonna find our full length interviews after a while because. I know we've been spoiling you on YouTube right now with all these full-length interviews. It, that's going to go away. But for a small membership fee, you can see it all on our Patreon channel. And sometimes even before time. So y'all need to go ahead and get with it. See you there. Man, you know, um, <clears throat> we've, we've done a lot of interviews. Um, we've we've uh, interviewed a lot of different uh, people that, that basically uh, make, make people smile, mm -hmm. make people cry. cry. Make people laugh, you know. Change their lives. Um, this guy right here, you know, uh, we, me and you sit back and watched a lot of his m movies that mm -hmm. we, we seen some things and, 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 and some things that happen on his movies that you don't see everywhere where when it comes down to, you know, real uh, thing, things that can change one's life, man. Mm -hmm. uh, this guy right here, man, he don't need no introduction, man. He actually a local. You know, uh, this guy here, my wife said, you got to interview him. Ain't no way you can have Boss Talk 101 and don't interview Mr. M. Legend Brown, man. Thank you so much. I appreciate you guys uh, having me. There you go, man. Hey, mm -hmm. man, Mr. M. Legend Brown is in the building. We about to get into it. This guy right here has a lot of nuggets that he about to drop on. If you listening and your ears is, is not poking up yet, just wait on it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Mr. Brown, Mr. M. Legend Brown is about to tell you some things that can help you, tell you some things that he's been through, and I'm going to chime in because I got a little something to say. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> so is Legend your middle name or you just made up that whole name? I made up that whole name. Okay. I used to call out to L.A. and uh, try to get actors to come and work in Dallas, and they'd be like, don't nobody work in Dallas. They don't shoot movies in Dallas. And so... They eventually get passed out, and they said, "Well, we look you up, and we can't find you." Mm -hmm. So this. And what was your name before that? I just went by Michael Brown. Okay. And uh, so this lady told me one time she she was very she used a lot of uh, exclamation points when she was telling me this. She said, "Well, you tell them to Google you, and then change <laughs> your name." And then and so I was watching uh, something with M Night Shyamalan, and I was like, "Hmm." And so I started googling, and there was no no other M plus something. And then I was watching I Am Legend. And I was like, huh. Ah. I Am Legend. And, and of course, Brown, your last name. Yes. And then it just kind of stuck. And I well, was thinking, nobody's going to call you that. No, that's a long name. And when, every time when I heard it, I'm like, okay, maybe M is his first name. And Legend is just, you know, he put that in there. It might be his middle name. People do name their kids Legend. Mm. And so I was, wasn't sure if that was your, you know. No, and then I was trying to, uh, trying to, trying to inspire myself to be great. You know great. what I mean? I, that's the reason I picked the legend is because like, but I you, like it. You're trying to be great. I like it. And uh, it's kind of like my company is Poor Child Films, mm. and people used to beat me up so much about that. Ah, oh, you you speaking, you speaking uh, negativity on mm -hmm. your company's name. You don't. I'm like, no. I come from a very very poor place, and I never want to forget. I never want to get big head. I never want to walk around like I'm it somebody. Reminds you. I want to remember that. No matter how how much success I have, I come from a humble beginning, and I always wanted to remember that. Right, I uh, love that. M. Legend Brown, you know, I, I came up with my name. Let me just say that. Uh, people call me E, you know, from back in the days, and I just always was dealing with money, so I decided to be the C e money. CEO. There you mm. go. E C E O. Okay. All because they messed my cards up. My name. <laughs> I had to put E Smith C E O, and they end up putting E C E, e -O. o Smith. I say, you know what? I'm gonna rock with that. <laughs> Must be God. Look <laughs> you know? at God. Yeah, I went on and went with it. That's good. That's so, good. were you born and raised in Terrell, Texas? No. Ah. I'm actually. Uh, we were born in West Dallas. West Dallas, really? Yeah. Yeah. My mom. Um, my mom decided after I turned three years old, she was going to move me and Kathy, my sister, 
we were moving down with my family that lives in Rockwall. So I actually okay. lived on the borderline of Rockwall and Terrell. So if we walked on this side of the house, mm-hmm. we were in Rockwall. Mm-hmm. We walked on this side of the house, we were in Terrell. That's 205? Is that 205? 205. Mm-hmm. Okay, so so you don't even remember nothing about West Dallas. I'm not even going to ask you about nobody <laughs> no, in West Dallas because you no. left at three years old. Mm-hmm. So you say you moved with your mom. So where was your dad during this time? Never knew my dad. At all? Ever. Never met him. Do you know his name? Don't even know his name. My mom wouldn't tell me his name. She I was told about me, to say, does she know who he is? She knows who he is. The birth certificate. Now, check this out. My birth certificate says Johnny Taylor. <laughs> hey, Johnny, you got somebody out here you don't know. I don't know, know if it's that Johnny Taylor. But, <laughs> but okay. yeah, yeah, she wouldn't tell me. And then it's like, you know how it is. Because I, you can put, as a female, can you put just anybody's name under? I don't know. Or, you know. I don't know. And it's been a big secret. Like, every people have known in my family, but they would never tell me. I was about to say, grandma, auntie, somebody you must have asked. And- I had a one uncle that was going to tell me, and he passed. So I'm like, what is the big secret, you know? I think that would make you more curious. You know, for a while it did. I All my stories when I was writing short films were stemmed off. I had a story called, Why Do I Look Like My Father? You know how you go around and people saying, Oh, you look just like your daddy. And you're like, you don't even know. Oh, so the people told you that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So everybody knew who he was, but, you know, maybe so I in my he was mind, a killer, I thought that's he was what a, I was a rapist, yeah, something that know. they're trying not for yeah, you to fall yeah. in that footsteps, so right, to say. Right. I don't know, something. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. But, um, Hold on. Father, yeah, he wanted to jump into help that. your children. So you got a father. Mm hmm. You always got a father. Of course. Mm-hmm. The real, true father, the spiritual father. That's the father that matters the most. Yes. To be honest with you, and when you tap into God, you understand who your father really is. This is my beloved son who I'm very well pleased in. That's it. That's it. You see what I'm saying? That's the good part of not being taunted with, oh, he just like his daddy, daddy with this or daddy was that. God can always step in that thing and boom. No. I mean, but you know, you, the, sorry, go so ahead. Even if you think about it spiritually, after what? We didn't hear about Joseph. Mm-hmm. Even at the cross, mm-hmm. you know? So, I, you know, I never really, the only thing I wanted to know was that my uh, history of medical. illness. That's medical. exactly, that's the reason why I always ask these questions. And I always tell women, I said, don't stop your kids from trying to be a part of their father's life. I understand there's some deadbeat dads out there who don't want to have nothing to do with the kids. And it all depends on so many different situations. He could have had another family, wife, <laughs> kids, whatever. But then in that case, you want to make sure your son not dating his sister. Right. You know, so there's a lot of different things you want to make sure, reason why you'd want them to know that side of the family. You know, medical issues is number one, because then when you go to the doctor and say, okay, is there such and such on your mom's side? Is there such and such on your dad's side? Correct. You can't, he's like, I don't know. I don't know. You know what I mean? And I don't know what traits are going to hit me or am I going to. Exactly. And in today's society, doctors do not check for everything before time. It's when all of a sudden you're hurting, then that's when, and that's the terrible thing about the medical industry right yeah. now. They don't yeah. pre-check unless you just request, request yes. it. Well, you have to do your work. Right. Let me get in there again. <laughs> <laughs> By his stripes, <laughs> you are healed. Come on now. He took 39 <laughs> lashes, except one, for your health. So he dives right back into the same situation and corrects it for you again. It's all about how you feel from your spiritual standpoint to understand how to overcome anything that you're going through in the flesh. Mm -hmm. And I know y'all don't want to hear me talk about this every time, but I always got something to say, even when you bring your counselors in here. (laughs) Because Jesus is my counselor. So I think think a lot of times we just, we, we get caught up in the flesh and, and you know it says something about the eyes, you know. You know, when you start to look at these things, it, you let these things overtake who you are mm-hmm. spiritually in God. Mm-hmm. But who you are really is who I can't see, and that's mm-hmm. that spirit man. I see you outside, but it's that spirit man that's way more important mm-hmm. than the physicality could ever be. Because without it, you wouldn't even be able to talk. Right, right. That's all. I'm, I'm going to get back. Go ahead. Keep going. 
Oh, but let me ask you a question. <laughs> oh, though. me? Yes, you. Oh, man. <laughs> but you know how God gives us all different talents. Mm-hmm. Some doc- some doctors mm-hmm. have the talent to heal people uh-huh. um, through, yes, medicine and mm-hmm. so forth. And some even do it through prayer if they mm-hmm. believe. So you don't think that's warranted or needed? Let me just say this. There was a woman in the Bible day. She had been sick for so very long. Mm-hmm. The doctor did all he could. And the medicine was no good. Okay. She she had been bleeding for twelve long years, mm-hmm. and and she had went to every physician she could. She had exhausted all her resources, and when it came down to it, she seen Jesus passing by, and she said, "But if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I know I'd be made whole right now." So she goes and she fights through, and she gets down low and she grabs that hem. And she's healed. Why am I saying that? I'm saying when you have exhausted all your resources, you will go to God. I, I do agree with that. that. Mm-hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. You may get healed somewhat, but you still, if you don't go to God, you won't get a full healing anyway. I'm giving you the, this is the truth from my, the way I believe. You can go and get all these band-aids on your issue. But when it come down to true healing, you will never, ever experience it until you lock into God. That's how I believe. Mm-hmm. But I don't know how everybody's believe. I just know that's how I feel about it. And it's been that way for many, many years now. Because I just don't think that we give God enough respect. And that's fearing God. Reverence when it come down to health. Reverence when it come down to counseling. Reverence when it come down to different things in life. We got to get better at that. And I was screaming at the top of my lungs until I, to this podcast goes away. Because I know I've had all these, you know, people to sit in that chair mm-hmm. and they don't know the word. They don't even know it. And then they'll tell you it ain't true. It ain't even read it. You understand what I'm saying? So I have to stand in the gap for what I know God to be true in my life in. Right. So I'm not going to play with them right. when it comes down to what I believe in. Right. Does that make sense? Right. It does. It does. Because they don't read it. They don't even know it. But they'll challenge it. And I'm supposed to sit here and just take that when God didn't already gifted me to understand his word. I'm not going to play like that. That's some real talk. That's real talk. So when you say whatever you say, I got something for you. We He brought up Joseph, not me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so when we go in there, you can't be lukewarm anyway. 3 and 16 of Revelations. Mm-hmm. That means you a little bit over here and a little bit over there when it comes down to your belief system. You got to be all the way in. You got to totally surrender. Now, does that no, mean you're going to be perfect? To see, that I don't mean you're going to be perfect. I was checking about you know the medical I mean? part. I was just checking about a medical part, but you did answer. You say, yes, you go to them first or you go to them. Yeah. You go to them, and but you still need this as well. You know, Luke was a physician. Okay. He was following Jesus. Did you? <laughs> You understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. He was with him. When when Luke, was he there when, when Peter's wife, a mother-in-law had the headache? The disciples. What I'm saying is, right. he was there on these instances when Jesus may be doing all these healings with Jairus' daughter or, or, or dealing with these different situations. Mm-hmm. All I'm saying is, when he called Lazarus from the dead, In John, chapter 11, when he called him, he said, Lazarus, come forth. Mm -hmm. They was there. All these different, whatever you want to call it. All I'm saying is we have to do like Jesus. We got to depend on the power of God to change our circumstance situation. I can go all day with that Mm -hmm. kind of stuff because Mm -hmm. it's what I believe in. Right, right. And and, and, And that's true. <clears throat> and I think you get certain gifts to help people in certain ways. I agree with that too. You know, and when we talk about the lady with the issue of blood, her faith had to be strong. Had to be. I agree with that. Because if she could have touched his garment all day long without the faith, everybody was bumping into him, according to Peter Neal. But he only felt her. That's right. <laughs> he knew when she touched him because the faith was so strong. Mm-hmm. And that's where, when I talked to people, I said, when you in this business, you got to have faith. Because, you know, I sat down with a producer one time and, uh, you know, I was on this quest. How do you get money? How do you get money? How do you get money for films? He said, man, Mike, I'm just going to sit down and tell you. I get a whatever God give me, I go do the best I can with it. 
and I start on it and I challenge him to give me the rest. I said, what? How does that work? What do you mean? You challenge God. You don't nobody challenge God. He said, I go to work and I tell everybody on the set that God going to give me the rest of the money. And he said, before we finish, we, we, uh, we have the money. Mm. His name was Tim Grace. Wow. I, I took that and ran with it. Every time I do a film, we pray. I start out with whatever somebody give me. I said, okay, God, <laughs> you can't make us look like, not, not me. I'm like, you can't make we, we. look like <laughs> we don't know what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. And every time, he's, he's worked a miracle on set. When we shot this other film, I did Joe and the Reaper. He, it rained so hard the day we needed to shoot outside with the ambulance and the fire department and the police. And they were calling me. They're like, I don't think we're going to shoot. And my DPs and everybody like, what are we going to do, Mike? I was like, I don't know. When 5 o'clock comes, we'll see what happens. Why did the sky just break? Wow. Sun come out. We filmed that scene in two hours. Soon as I say cut and we go back The inside, rain started man, back again. Come in like, no. like a monsoon. I was like, everybody's like, that always happened on your set. I'm like, no, nah, it ain't just my <laughs> set. <laughs> it happens a lot of places, but you just happen to see it because you're so close mm-hmm. to the fire. And I think when we talk about the disciples, they're, they were so close to Jesus that they couldn't even believe what they seen. Mm-hmm. Think about the, the boat. You know, they had to go down there and get him out the boat saying, what, <laughs> you going to let us perish? Right. You know, and then they, after he does what he does, they say, well, what kind of man is this? How you mm-hmm. that close to the maker and you don't know? Mm-hmm. So that goes to tell us, too, most people can't understand your talent. Most people can't understand your gifts. I don't care how close they are to you. They don't understand the gift that God gave you. How can you write stories in two days when it takes me six months or two years? How can you shoot a film in two weeks when it takes me two years just to get the film out? How can you work on $15 when I have to work on Mm $15,000? How do you do that? Well, that's my favor. That's my grace. Wow. I like that. So I wanted to get back into, okay, so you lived in, Border rock wall and terror mm-hmm. growing up. And I'm sure that this is not what you wanted to do when you were growing up. No. As a kid. And how many of y'all siblings? How many siblings? Just me and Kathy. Really? Just two? Mm-hmm. Wow. And your mom did everything by herself. Well, yeah, her, my uncles, and your my uncles. stepdad, and I had a stepdad. Or okay, so she. Kathy's she, daddy, we say. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. So you had male role models I in did, your life. I did. Okay, I did. awesome. So at what age? Or before we get into what age, tell me about an instance, something growing up as a child that you difficulty that you had to overcome as a child growing up in your neighborhood, in your area. You know, every time when you know when you're young, you always think that it's the end of the world. Like, oh my God, I'm going through this. Never thought you could overcome it. See, we live so far out in the country. Mm-hmm. There was maybe it maybe it was thirty miles before the next house. So Kathy's daddy used to come and get her mm-hmm. every week. And I'd be sitting there. Bored? No, not bored. I'd be sitting there because I didn't have a daddy to come get right. me. And I remember sitting in the window, and Kathy be waving by, and I'd be just sitting there. I'd be boohooing, crying, because I didn't have a daddy to come get me. That was probably one of the most challenging moments in my life. And at that moment, I made a decision in my life. I was like, I would never have a kid if I can't be in that kid's life. At that point, I didn't know that you know, life changes and you can you can be in another place and be in this place and still be in your kid's life. Mm-hmm. I thought you had to be married. And if I couldn't marry the woman, I wasn't going to have a child mm-hmm. and and be there 100% because I didn't want any child to feel like what I felt. You and know? so many, I've heard that so many times, they don't want to be that dad who was absent. And some of them, of course, you know, couldn't end up being with the mother because of, you know, grown up differences. But they, everyone that I've actually spoken to have been in their kid's life, mm-hmm. you know, traveling, being with them, taking them <clears> with <throat> them, so forth. But I like that story. Yeah. I like mm-hmm. that story. So when did you decide to um, branch off into film and how did you do it? Well, see, I was always a storyteller. And I'm how honest. old were you? Uh to branch in the film, mm-hmm. 35. That old? Mm-hmm. And because isn't mom, that like too late sometimes for some people might think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty not going to film school, not going to have any formal training. Right, nothing. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty old. But it was at the time when I was 
I was just so uh, confused on what I wanted to do. And the thing that kept reverting back to me was my writing. Mm -hmm. And people used to say, oh, man, you write these great stories, man. What you going to do with them? And then I went to see Lean On Me. Mm. And I sat there and watched Lean On Me all for a whole day. And everybody in the theater, we all sat there. We never moved. We clapped. We cried. We cheered. We did everything at the same moment. Mm. And I was like, whatever that is, <laughs> that's what I want to do. I want to make people feel, feel like that, that way. And then that started me on my quest. It took me another two years to start to uh, feel like how I can make films and how I could. And I started writing books at the time. And uh, my barber would cut my hair. He did. He did skits. His name was Milkshake. He did skits. And so he asked you to write him a skit. Yeah, he asked me to write him a, a movie. A movie. And, and, okay. And then once I wrote it, he said, "Why don't you direct it?" I wrote it like a stage play. That's how much I knew. Mm -hmm. And we filmed it. It became a hood classic. And what's the name of that one? Against the Grain. Against the Grain. Against the Grain. But well, why did you start writing in the first place? <coughs> you said everybody would see your writing, and loved it. So why I did you? Wrote. I always wrote. I always told stories. I would tell stories. It'd be a hundred kids in our yard coming from everywhere, and p parents dropping them off. Mama used just to, to sit so, down and hear you tell, hear me tell stories about a about a character named Junior. I really? would tell stories so much about that character, and then you know how you do something so much you don't know that you're doing it. When mm -hmm. I go back to high school, I see some of my old church. Uh, mm -hmm. They want you to tell them a story. <laughs> no, they just said, "Man, I, I can't believe you telling films." Man, you used to tell us all these stories all, all these the time. I was like, "Why wow, I told y'all stories?" Because you you just kind of you're in that zone, or you're doing right. what you do, and you don't really think about what you're doing. And so, when I left my job, I actually quit. I kept praying, "God, please take me out the job. God, please take me out the job." And He finally took me off the job, and I took my four hundred one k. And I met this business partner after who helped me with against the grain. We took both our, our 401ks. We had like sixty thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and we tried to make a film, and it just did not work. Mm. And at that moment, I said, "You know what? Well, let me back up a little." Hold bit. on, but you made the film. You tried to make a film with only people that you knew. No, we hired actors. You hired actors. We hired actors. But How did you find these actors to hire them? Through agencies. Oh, you went through agencies. Okay. And uh, they didn't know anything. The actors, I didn't know that the actors didn't know nothing, and I didn't know nothing. So we would have workshops. We would do everything. But let me back up just mm -hmm. a little bit. So after I finished Against the Grain, Against the Grain was like a hood comedy. It was like Friday or Master P movie. <laughs> but it just it just took off. In, but I didn't want to make those movies anymore. Right. I was like, I don't want to make hood classics. I want to make movies that inspire and give hope to people. Mm -hmm. So, but while we were doing Against the Grain, we could never get it to burn to a DVD. Mm. And so we tried everything. We'd wake up every morning and go check the computer and it crashed and we'd be mad. So we finally took it to this place downtown called Pegasus. It was a, uh, it was a uh, community TV station. And so they, uh, they, they, they took it in the back, they watched it and then they came back out and man, they belittled me, laughed at me, talked crazy to me, told me they would, if they ever see a camera in my hand, they would knock it out of my hand. They would mm. fight me. They would kill me. It was that bad. It was that bad. Well, to them, it was that bad. But you didn't think so. I didn't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, I went to the car. At that time, I was playing semi-pro football. I grabbed Did you my cry? gun. Man, I cried like a baby when I got in the car. I grabbed my gun. I said, I'm going in there and kill everybody in that building. And I can't I even not, look at you as that person. And I could not get the door open. The door would not open. I pulled on the door. I tried to bang, break the glass with the gun. It would not move. And then in my... Rage, and after I sat there and I was crying, and God said, "Listen, don't ever let anybody else talk to you like that." He says, "Now nah, I'm not gonna say you're gonna make a great movie, but go and learn and understand what you're doing, so nobody will ever talk to you mm -hmm. like that again." So I quit my job. I went to the library. I took two years and read every book in the library about filmmaking, and then I pursued on sets and I did everything else. And then two years later, I made a short called "Kiss by the Devil." Mm. That same company called me, reviewed my film, and said, you're the filmmaker of the future. Really? I never mentioned who I was, that they had told me what they had told me, nothing. And Kiss, all, what's it called again? Kiss? It's called Kiss by the Devil. It was about a, it was about a son who's seen uh, something that his father had done, mm -hmm. and he wouldn't tell. Mm -hmm. And so, <clears throat> so he was kissed. We, I called it Kiss by the Devil. He was mm -hmm. kissed by the devil. Wow, I think I saw that. I did see that pop up. Yeah. Um, and I was like, so what? So you going back and looking at your first movie mm -hmm. compared to this, what was the difference? 
What did you do just better? No, just no. Know. What did you do better in this in the second one that you did not do at all in your first one? Uh, cast better. Understood. What well, I had learned the craft. Uh, not uh, well. Let me rephrase it. I ain't learned the craft. I hired a DP. We had. I was shooting the first one. Okay. I was doing the makeup in the first one. I was doing. You were doing the makeup. I was doing everything. <laughs> I did. I learned how to do special effects makeup. <laughs> oh wow! Because I realized. So backing up just a little bit more, as a little kid, my mom thought I was crazy because my imagination would just be like, wow, it'd just be everywhere. And I just couldn't control it. So I'd talk to plants. I'd be telling stories to anybody would listen. And she so thought she you were like, crazy. She was like, we're going to lock you up in Terrell State Hospital. Right. And so I went to school crying one day, and I would tell him this. We had one black teacher at Rockwall High. And she told me, she said, Mr. Epps, she said, come here, boy. What's wrong with you? Why are you in here crying? I said, because my mama says you're going to lock me up. And so Miss Epp said, come here. She said, I'm, she gave me a, a yellow notepad. And she said, write down everything you're thinking. You're going to come here every hour before school starts and write down everything you're thinking. Because, you know, black mama gets you to school three hours before mm. the school even starts. <laughs> <laughs> so I would write that down. But that would only bring my imagination down like 10%. Mm. Still was going crazy. So she said, okay. So she took me to the library. She handed me Tom Sawyer. And everything just kind of like. Like the whole world just came into one little small ball. So that helped me focus my energy into something that, because I would just read book after book. I knew book there was a reason book. you started writing. And that's what I was trying to get into earlier. Yeah. And I'm thinking that's it, this, yeah. right, this is where it came from. Yes, yes. And then it got to the point where I, I could write, and I still to this day. I can write, but I don't know grammar. I don't know punctuation. So I had a teacher, Miss Hill. <laughs> she says, baby. You do what most people can't do. There's there's people who, what you can't do, there's a hundred of those people. Mm -hmm. But there's a small percentage of people who can do what you can do. You can I hire like people that. to do what you can't do. She said, but there's a lot of people that can't write and tell stories and have your imagination like you have. Mm -hmm. She said, so don't bog yourself down with, with punctuation and grammar. You pay people to do that. You'll get to awesome. a place where you can pay people to do that. That kind of helped me, and then it hurt me at the same time. Because now I, be, I, I just the grammar just when I send my work to somebody that be ink yeah, they I'll yeah. be like, oh my gosh, <laughs> how can I keep making these mistakes? As you say, you can hire somebody, let them deal with that part. <laughs> yes, but that's amazing. So okay, so the second film you did that you hired a whole new cast. You went no, through we the didn't agency. The second film. Okay, go ahead. We uh, we got. <clears throat> we started shooting and then we just kind of messed up. The, I just didn't, even, I really didn't know what I was doing, but we lost both of our uh, 401ks. And my, mm -hmm. my my producer or my business partner, he, for about five years after that film, he's like, man, we sure we can't put that film out. Man, mm -hmm. we sure we, I said, that was just a film class, brother. You know, that's what we learned. So I met this DP who just passed about uh, last year. Mm -hmm. He says, if you'll do a short film, I'll come and shoot it. Mm. And he says, if you can do some short films, you'll learn how to do your craft. Right. And so I learned to start doing short films. And I, I was so eager. I'd do one, and then the next month I'd do another one, and the next month I'd do another one because I was just trying to learn. I was just, it was so exciting. And every time you did one, you learned something more. And I got, yeah, I would fix what I messed up in right. the, the first one. The second one, I would, the third one, I'd fix what I messed up in the second one, and mm -hmm. I just kept doing that till I figured out, oh, that's okay, okay. And I had a little grasp on it. And I did not feel, figured out what my, couldn't even figure out what my style was till I was maybe two years ago. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, everybody says, "Oh, that's that M Legend Brown touch," and I'm mm -hmm. like, I don't "Just till two means. years ago, you've been doing this for a minute. Wow!" But I still, you know, you know, when somebody says, "Okay, what is what is it when we watch your film? What is the signature of your film?" That's hard for me to tell you what is I because I don't know what somebody else watches my film and what they see. You know what I mean? Like, what is it that you say when you watch it and say, "Oh, that's an M. Legend Brown film"? No, I know. What Out of all of them, it's the it's the, what you it's the touch of God. I think that's more so for me than anything. Um, I know that when I'm watching your film, I ain't got to worry about my kids seeing something that they shouldn't be seeing. A lot of that stuff matters, man. I think a lot of time we give way to these these the way of the world so much. We know that that path is narrow. We just got to understand and respect it. Mm -hmm. God will do the rest. But a lot of times we, we want it. To, you know, you got to enjoy where you're at, man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because that, I mean, those movies, man, 
That old John when he was running around. That old boy. That, old, <laughs> that was listen, funny to me. Listen, when that old boy was running around, that that, that was good stuff mm, right there. Right. Because right. it because one thing I've always talked about was how segregated the the church system is. The way and and that pretty much gave me a, a, a it kind of confirmed for me how people have split up. That's what the devil uses. He uses that for division, and people hadn't tapped into that yet. And you somewhat tapped into it, being that you, you know, made that look that way. Mm -hmm. It brings a visual to it. And then at the end of the day, I think, I think it's needed. I think people need to know that we can go anywhere and do anything with anybody because we all one body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it showed the division in the church, and it showed the division outside. Yeah, because correct. And that's politics. That's what people always say. You have politics in the church, and it, it just showed all of that. But it showed. It always shows coming back to a happy end, and it shows the lessons. That's what I love is the different lessons that you learn from the indi each individual person that's saying something, say something that's educational, mm -hmm. as in like a life lesson. Right. You know what I mean? And that's what right. I love about it. Any of your films. Right. And I love the love that comes across. And he, of course, as he said, you know, God in it. I love it. Um, since we started doing this, we look at not only the lesson, but we look at the quality, look at the um, the audio. I mean, everything. And to me, a lot of that is, it's perfect. You know what oh, I mean? Thank you. And I'm sure that you, as a perfectionist, as you say that you keep going back, you're looking even at your most recent film and you'd be like, no, nah, I didn't do that right. I, right. I need to change this. I need to, you know, but there's no right. such thing as perfection. We no, know that, right? We chase it though. We chase it, but up to the day you die, there's something going to be like, right. I could have right. done that right. better. And I think as artists, that's one of the nuggets we're going to say nugget. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's one of the nuggets I think that you, you teach artists is you can't make a perfect project. People spend so much time trying to take out all of the imperfections. As humans, if we look at our body and we stand in front of the mirror, mm -hmm. no matter how much we work out, no much, the, the guy. There's always something. It's all we're going to always see. Why my earlobe so big? You know what I mean? So sometimes you just got to let. And actors have made careers off of their imperfections. Mm -hmm. You know, look at Forrest Whitaker, his eye. You know, most people think that's that that's what his signature is. You right. know, we see a Forrest Whitaker and then we see just different imperfections that that are unique uniqueness that make us special. Mm -hmm. So I think every film, if you try to get every imperfection out of your film, you gotta have good sound, good picture, and good acting. Right. Everything else will take care of itself. Exactly. But if you're trying to make sure you got the perfect sound, you didn't. You didn't you, that had to start when you first started. Mm -hmm. There's going to be some time that you're just not going to get the perfect sound. So how long were you doing film before you started, um, I want to say, because in my eyes, hiring bigger actors? Like, of course, the person that I've seen <clears throat> in every single one of your films, Miss Irma Hall. Mm -hmm. How did you get her? And why you continue to use her in each and every single film that you do? You know, at Miss Hall, I was at a film festival. Mm -hmm. It was the Texas Black Film Festival. And uh, the first award I ever won, and they were giving her a lifetime award. Okay. And it was her, it was Robert Townsend, it was a bunch of folks there. And me and her got an award at the same time, and I had remembered her, and I was like, Miss Hall, I'd love to work with you one day. And she, she just spit out her number. Oh, wow. Said, Call me, baby. We'll work. I, I work with independent filmmakers. And I asked her for a picture, and she was like, okay, get out of my light. And then step <laughs> on this side. And then we'll get but she's been like a mentor to me. Mm -hmm. She took me under the wing. She says, my, God sends her a bunch of Michaels. And she says, you're almost like my son. So when my mama passed uh, last year, mm -hmm. or a year before last, she said, um, she said I'm, I'm still here. I'm your mama. And so she's always been mentoring. Everywhere I go, she puts me out there. Um, she, she says, you know, she's talking to, if she's talking to somebody who has some recognition, she'll be like, you know, legend? And I'm like, hey, hey, this your moment. Don't, no, don't put me out there. <laughs> this, your, this your moment. I don't need you to, you know. But she's always been that kind, that generous. I'll give yeah. you a brief story of how kind she was. So, you know, I'm a grown man, 50 years old. I'm getting honored at this big event. I don't have a suit. They calling me to say, hey, man, we need to confirm you coming to this big gala. I don't have a suit. And I'm like, I'm crying. I'm boohooing. Mm. I'm crying. I'm crying. She just happened to call me, and I'm trying to hide my tears. She said, what's wrong with you? 
I said, oh, mama, I got I to gotta go to this big event. And they're giving me an a achievement award, and I don't have a suit. And I'm just going to look crazy up in there. She said, baby, come see me. So I go see her. She slides this money over, and she said, Poopy going to take you, her daughter, going to take you to get you a suit. And we went up on Red Bird. I said, no, I'm not doing it. I'm not taking no money from you. You're on Social Security. I'm not taking money from mm-hmm. you. I was looking for the hand after I said it because I knew what I did say it. I thought I was going to get slapped. Man, she looked at me so cold. She said, are you that prideful that you can't take a hand out? She said, that's my blessing. Don't change exactly. my blessing. So I, you know, I knuckled under and I go, I get fitted. For, I'm pouting the whole time. I get fitted for the suit. They, they do the suit and everything. I go, I get my achievement award. But what I took, that's how she took care of me. That's how she, she, uh, she just always was like, no, this is your moment to shine. Mm. So don't let this don't let this particular thing steal your joy. Right. So if somebody else can help you, let us help you. And that's been in my life all all through. Even the guy that I told you was my DP, David mm-hmm. Pinkston. I met David at the one that shot it. He wouldn't even shoot my first film, but he wanted to shoot the uh, he wanted to shoot the uh, short film. Mm-hmm. But David, I was struggling so bad living in this apartment. David believed in me so much, and he mentored me so much. He would put, he would give me movies and DVDs, and he'd call me, "Man, have you read them books?" And I used to read. I'd read everything he sent me. But this one day, I was so tired, and I just couldn't. I was so depressed. I was hungry, and my stomach hurt, and I just <laughs> couldn't focus. He said, "Have you read them books?" You ain't call me because I would call him the next day and say, "Yeah, man, let's talk about this book. Let's talk about this book." I said, "Nah, David, I haven't. Have you watched the movies?" I said, "Nah, David, I can't." I said, "Man, I'm just. I, I just don't feel good today." He said, All right, "Well, call me when you watch them." And I was like, man, let me just read this because I always read the book. That was $100 in each 10-page chapter of the book. That was $100 in each 10 DVDs. Mm-hmm. I just sit there and cried like a baby. But God has always put people. And I always thought, am I that? Um, there was a movie like that where somebody hid money in a book. <laughs> yeah. I was like, am I that dependent that people have to do that for me? Right. And, again, that's pride, right? Yeah. And I was like, okay, God, okay. There is always somebody in your life that helps you. It's whether you see it or not. There's that's angels helping, around Yeah, that's you helping time. you move forward. Right. I had another guy named Doc. Um, he used to help me so much, man. And he, he'd come. He said, come by the office. Mike, I got something for you. And I'm thinking he got, he used to teach karate to help my actors learn karate. And one day I went up there and I sat there for about 30 minutes and he didn't show up. And then I left. And then he called me and says, man, you all right? Because you, I could set my clock up by the time you're going to be there. You say you're going to be there, you're going to be there. So I could set my clock by that time. I said, man, Doc, I waited you on 30 minutes. I had to go home. And he said, no, come back. And then he would, you know, slide money my way. And I was like, come on, Doc, I ain't, ain't got to do this. He said, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put you in a chokehold. <laughs> I was like, all right. But it's always been that in my life. Even when I did my first feature film, Hiding in Plain Sight. Mm-hmm. I did it as a short because I ran into a family that was homeless and they told me their story. It impacted me so much. I was like, I got to do this story. And I, I had told people that I'm not doing no more short films. I said, I'm not doing another short film. I'm moving on. Because I read a book that only black men do 10, 12 short films. They never do feature films. Really? So I said, okay, well, I'm not doing any more short films. Mm. I'm doing a feature. And uh, so when they told me that story, I, I called my producers and I said, listen, I got to tell this story and it's going to be a short film. And they were like, oh, Mike, we ain't telling no more short films. We ain't telling no more short films. And so I told them the story and they were like, oh, okay. And then I went to the guy that would give me all my equipment. I said, listen, I'd like for you to shoot this film. I said, it's a short film. It won't be a... He said, nope, not doing a short film, Mike. I'm not... Nope, I'm done. I don't do short films. I'm tell done. him the story. I told him the story. He says, I'm in. <laughs> it was that good. We wound up shooting it i get into the editing bay and i said this is too much this is this is i can't even do this story justice as a short film what's the name of this movie um hiding in plain sight oh hiding in plain sight okay and so i go home and i'm talking to my uncles now my uncle was a very practical you go to school you get a job (laughs) you blah 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 it ain't no all this filmmaking stuff Mm -hmm. no we don't do that we raise cattle we all got jobs we this is what we do so when i told them and just me telling them, they was like, you know what? I didn't tell them story. I told them what, what was going on with me. And they was like, so you, it's a, what, so what does that have to do? To, well, how do you have to do it as a feature? Right. I said, well, I need at least $20,000 to do it as a feature. They were like, okay, we got you. I was like, what? And they said, yeah, we got you. And I was like, so we got the money. We went and made this film. So you changed it from the short film to a feature to film. To a feature film. 
And we got distribution right out the door, which is unheard of. Wow. The lady called me, who was a sales rep for me. She says, I cried when I just watched the trailer. I want to represent this film. So you sent it out to them, or you just had it one out the and they actors, saw it? One of the actors on the film had a knew a lady that worked for a distribution. Uh, e, e, uh, E1 and Bridgestone and all okay. those guys. And so she sent it. To, he sent it to her, and she was just like, yeah, I got to sell this. God's convicted me to sell this. And we sold it. We had Forever Jones do some music on it. It was just, it was a, like a perfect storm. And then, and then we did uh, Steps of Faith right after that. That's when I hired Malik and uh, Christy mm-hmm. Ferris. I had met Malik. So you reached film. out. That's what I was saying. How did you get Malik? Malik was I was I did a short film that we Kissed by the Devil mm-hmm. that we screened out in L.A. And uh, so we after party, it was just I, it was at a bar. They were dancing, and I just just wasn't celebrating. I was sitting by myself and Malik came over and we just had like a two hour conversation and he gave me his number. And then when I came up with, I, w- I was trying to do another film called A Miracle for Haven. Mm. And uh, still to this day, I can't get, cannot get that film. I get a lot of people, a lot of companies uh, interested and then we just never get the trigger pull. So when I did Steps of Faith, I was like, Malik, would you be interested in this? He read the script, called me back in two hours. I love that about like actors that do that. If I send you a script and you call me back the next day, I'm like, yes. Mm-hmm. You read, or in a couple of hours, I'm like, yes, you read the script. You like the script. And we just went on to make that journey. And then I hired Christy. And Christy helped me get Ted Lange and Tracy Ross. And it mm-hmm. just kind of worked out. And then from there, we would just always, from there, I would reach out to other people and say, hey, do you know this person? Hey, do you, like when we got uh, Miss... Uh, Oh man, I can't even think of her name. She's in uh she's in uh, this hit series on uh on uh, that Nigerian hit series on uh on ABC right now. Okay, uh, I don't Obashala know. and Bob. Okay, I don't know her name. Oh, okay. She's uh you, you know her when she's in a bunch of commercials right now. Oh my goodness. That's how I got her. I called Ted Lange and I okay. said, hey, I said, Hey, could you help me get Miss Watson, Brene Watson? She was okay. the Fresh Prince mom. Oh, now yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know so who. I was like and she was like, yeah, sure, call her. And she's, here, she's waiting on your call right now. And I called her, and she's like, yeah, okay. And then we talked it out, and she came and worked. And then from there, I would just meet people through other people. So How did I, you meet Carl Payne? Uh, Tommy Ford. Mm. So I had met Tommy Ford at a film festival. Mm-hmm. And we became really good friends. And then he introduced me to Carl along with Malik. Okay, so you met them around the same yeah, time. Yeah, Okay. And so they all, and then me and Carl just kind of talked, and he told me he, you know, he don't want to just do the, the the cockroach thing or the right. or the Martin, you know, the coal on Martin mm-hmm. thing. He's like, I'm, I got some chops, and I was like, man, I'm that's what I'm looking for. I'm not looking for the stereotype character. And that's so hard for um, a lot of actors. To me, when I see some actors, you know, like where are they now? They get this huge role when they were younger. And it's like when everybody see that person, that's all they can think of. Um, I heard him on a podcast. It was um, the guy on Jamie Foxx show. Um, what's his name again? The, I call him the stuck up one. What's his name again? Um, Carl, Carlton. Carl. On the show. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't know his name. What's his real name? That's kind of I, I don't know his real name. Let but me look it up. <laughs> with him, I heard him on another podcast and he was like, he hates it. He hates to walk down the road. And everybody's calling him by that name because it's hard for him to, he even went into a, an audition. Did audition the way how it was supposed to. It wasn't even that type of character. And the people who were sitting there, they called him by that name. Right. And to him, he was like, that's such disrespectful. That's, right. you know, that's not right. what he's here for. Right, right, right. So, right. you know, and uh, Mike Epps has that problem. But I think some people embrace it and some people mm-hmm. don't. Like I remember bringing Karen Melina White to town and I just kept apologizing because everywhere we go, people would stop and ask for an autograph. I'm like, Karen, I'm so sorry. I'm just, she was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. She said, this is, this is, this what, is what I do. Right. And I was like, okay. Malik's the same way. I remember when I first hired Malik and this big studio company told me, he was like, man, don't nobody know who he is. So he came down to work on Steps of Faith and we went to Razoo's. There were literally 300 people standing in line waiting for his autograph. They were stealing the napkins from, from the <laughs> restaurant. The restaurant manager came over and said, I'm sorry, I don't know who you are, 
but we're going to comp your meal. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> I'm so sorry. And I want I sent that whole video to the studio and I was like, don't nobody know who he was, who he is. <laughs> wow, I want to go back to some, I want to go back to uh, Tommy Ford, mm -hmm. um, you know, his past and, and just <clears throat> the time that, you know, I seen a special that they did on him and his, his relationship with God and just being a stand up guy. Um, you you seen him in the and you couldn't really get a gist of who he really was in the Martin show for me. Mm -hmm. After he passed away, mm -hmm. you start seeing what they said about him, and it shaped his character in a way that it was just showing how how he was always there for everybody. And, mm -hmm. and it's just funny that you would say that he hooked you up with um, Carl, you know, because that's what I seen in 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 his character when they started to speak on him on that Martin special and other specials I've seen where they brought him up. So. I talked to him the day before he passed. Wow. That was so sad. Because he was telling me he had just had double knee surgery. Wow. And he said, Mike, he said, I don't know how I'm holding up all his ass, but these <laughs> knees is killing me. <laughs> and we had a conversation. He said, I want to go see my kids. Wow. One of them was down in Florida. He said, he said, but the, it's the holidays, and they don't. They say they're just gonna come up for Christmas. Man. And then I got. The, then I seen the news the next day, and I was like, "There is no way." I just talked to this dude, man. I wow. just so he didn't to. didn't didn't seem like it. it, it seemed nothing. Like he seemed nothing. fine. We were laughing on the phone. We were having a good time. And next thing you know, I'm like, "That cannot be true." Wait a minute. So you saying a day before? The day before. Did they say what he passed from? Blood clots. Blood clots. But oh. the day before, and that's the same thing I think mm -hmm. Heavy D passed from when he was on the airplane. But mm -hmm. a day before you speak to Tom B. Ford, and the next thing you know, he's passed away. And that's the, we, you know, Ronnie Spencer come on. One day you're here, the next, the next day, day you're day gone. gone. You know, you can't take life for granted. No, no. And you got to understand that time is, is but a vapor. Yes. So you got to you got to enjoy life while you got opportunity. Yeah. But Tom, that, he definitely was a special guy. Special guy. And he I enjoyed the, the heck guy. out of it. Yeah, he was the first guy to ever say <coughs> to, Sorry. to another guy, I love you, man, that I knew of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was saying that again. Yeah. He was the first guy to do what? Say, say I, love I love you to another guy. To another guy. He said, Mike, I love you. Wow. In the conversation, that's how he ended every conversation. And I was like, I love you too, bro. You know, you, you know, as guys. Made you feel kind of yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. But now it's, But you got used to it yeah, after a yeah, while. Yeah. yeah, and now I do it with everybody. Me and Malik, hey bro, I love you, man. Just checking on you. Wanna see how you're doing. In memory of Tommy Ford. Yeah, yeah, I do that with everybody, man. because we don't live long enough. Mm -hmm. You know, to we get so caught up in our own uh world. Yeah, and think we think this this is macho, this ain't macho, this is this is this is corny, this ain't corny. I call my friends sometimes, say, Hey man, I'm doing a wellness check. Come on, tell me how you're doing financially, mentally, and physically. Mm -hmm. It's just like um, even with what you what you said about that situation. When you think about, you know, when when you said that, you know, the kids will come for the holidays. It just makes me feel like you know, stop putting off things for tomorrow. You don't know tomorrow is going to ever come. And we interviewed Columbus Short, and he was talking about the passing of Twitch, and how people, you know need to be available for their friends, for people that they know, because you don't know what another person is going through. And even although they might not even tell you their business, but it's good for you to just do that wellness check. Call people, check in, no matter how busy you say you are. That's one thing I hate when people tell me, oh, I was busy. I bet you the right call or right person came along, you would drop everything you're doing for that moment in time. Because you don't want to live this life to be like, I wish I could. Because he even told us about a story about, what's a gentleman name? Something Lee that passed away previously, babe? Uh, I'm, uh, Jet Lee? Jet? Jet Lee, yeah. He's also another actor. He said when he was um, younger and they were really good friends. And he was calling Columbus like back to back to back to back. But Columbus was going through something himself. And he's like, man, I called him back. I ain't going to even answer it. The next day, found out he had died. So he's like, man, if Twitch had just called me. After that point, he never did that again. If his phone rings, he's going to answer it because he don't know what that person might need. I used to have this thing, like, I'm like, why am I the only person calling everybody every time? I used to feel that way. Now, I don't. I'm like, I'm calling my friends. I'm talking to them. I'm speaking to them. I don't care. You know what I mean? If I'm going to be the one that's calling, then it's just going to be me. But mm -hmm. I'm going to check on my friends because 
if I talk to you enough, if I spend time with you enough, I'll know when you're going through something. I'll mm-hmm. know when you off. Me and my best friend, he call, I called him yesterday and said, hey, man, you was in my spirit. I mm-hmm. uh, just want to check on you. He get all in his feelings. What, 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 what you two, wishing something bad on me? What, what, what you mean? I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I said, listen, I just said it just had some, but I don't know why you call it. That's, I don't know what that is. I said, well, you know what? Maybe you you own something right now. I'm going to mm-hmm. give you a minute. I'm going to call you back. But that has nothing to do with me. I right. did what I was, I did what my heart said to do. Right. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes we think, okay, well, then, you know, I shouldn't do that because this is the last response I got. No. God places stuff in your heart for a reason. A reason. And then you should act on that reason. Man. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Irma P. Hall, uh, Soul Food. Y'all mm-hmm. didn't get to, the, you know, that's why I seen her come off Soul Food and boom, she was working with you. I'm being real. That's how it looked to me. Mm-hmm. Now, am I mm-hmm. tripping? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. She it kind of seemed like she just slid on in there. I was like, okay, <laughs> there. Okay, now I see where she at. I kind of followed her because that was a big uh, uh, film. That was a that mm-hmm. was a that was a huge, huge film. film, and and I think uh, to see her over there was a uh, to see her working with you after that was just a breath of fresh air. So thank you very much for that, no, and no thank problem. you guys both for uh, uh, you know uh, hanging out with me, uh, you know, in the family. Yeah, she you know. reminds me of you know she reminds Aunt me Hattie. of Hattie. No, not Who? Aunt Hattie. She reminds me of a Cicely Tyson in a Tyler Perry movies. That's mm-hmm. another like like Tyler Perry movie. What do you think about Tyler Perry movies? Is that, it, it, do you have you watched you've watched him from the very beginning and mm-hmm. see how he mm-hmm. how his uh how mm-hmm. his family is and and how the success that he's come up on. How what do you think? Give me your give me your uh, uh, opinion on Tyler. You know what I think Tyler Tyler came in a time when we needed films to be told of that genre and that and I know a lot of people beat him up and say oh he's making these chitlin type films. <laughs> But we go to we we Mama Hall said it the best. She said, "Well, we go to we go to comedy clubs, and that's what they're doing. Mm-hmm. We don't make no big deal about that. They telling the same jokes he telling. They telling stuff that's happening in our world. But when Tyler do it, now they now we worried about what other people think about what we look like." She said, "So I'm a fan of him. I think his business model is brilliant, and I think Medea was in the time that everybody needed Medea. Mm-hmm. And 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 we can't criticize." But what what Tyler did, and Tyler's going to get some respect for this. Tyler spiked the move, uh, sparked the movement in the late two thousands. Ava DuVernay, uh, the guy that did Creed, what's his name, uh, and Black Michael Panther. Michael B. Jordan. No, the the director. The director. Uh, oh, that did, uh, we got a lot of directors because people were talking about Tyler, and then everybody said, "Well, shut up and stop talking about Tyler, and then go make your own movies." Mm-hmm. And then we we got a lot of directors that came out of that movie. After that, Tasha Smith and all these other other directors because of Tyler. Mm-hmm. No matter what you think of his movies, you either said, "I like his movies," or "I don't like his movies," and then guess what? You went out and made your own movies. Wow. Do you what do you th- what do you say to uh, Spike Lee? Was pretty critical toward him. In instances, um, I think Spike was a dinosaur at the time. He had never <laughs> seen nothing like that before. So he basically couldn't couldn't relate. Well, you got to realize they're from two different worlds. Yeah. You got uh, Tyler Perry from uh, down in New Orleans, and you got him that's way up from the East Coast in New York. Mm-hmm. And I, mm-hmm. and I think that just the cultureistic differences also makes a difference in it as and, well. And we hadn't seen nothing like that before. <laughs> we don't see no black man that own his own studio. Mm-hmm. So if you've been doing this for thirty years, forty years. I think you get rubbed the wrong way when somebody come in and do what you hadn't did. And made enough money where he can buy that much land to create this huge. That's not just a. It's yeah, a. Yeah, it's a real studio. It's a real studio. It ain't a corner down on Forty Second no. and 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 Forty Third. It's a whole. Yeah, whole I went down there and looked. Military ain't base. Ain't nothing yeah. to play with. Ain't nothing to play with. So, but we had never seen nothing like that before. So then, then you get in your feelings when somebody says, "Well, Tyler Perry got a studio." Messed him up, yeah. man! Shout out to that boy Spike Lee, man. Yeah, one, of, yeah. one of the dopest direct. He he's one of the dopest uh, producers as well, directors, right? Oh man, he's, he's the, one of he's the, the one of the greats. He is the OG, and that's mm-hmm. why he has yeah. something to say because he feel like he is the OG, and yes. he can say that. Yes, <laughs> yeah. and he can. It's like your uncle coming and say something. Don't always mean he's right, but he said what he felt. And yeah. we know in our family, we got people who say what they feel. It might not, but he came back and he Did, made it right. Didn't he come down when 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 Spike when he opened it? He had didn't he have Spike Lee pictures and everything up in there? Mm-hmm. But I mean, Spike made it right. Yeah, he eventually made it right. He made it right. You know, and and that's what we have to do. We don't always have to be. Uh, we don't always have to agree, but we do have to come back and make it right. We have to ask for forgiveness. Be that bigger person. Yes. Wow. Um, 
Um, um. <laughs> what I wanted to get into was um, Steps of Faith. You did that movie, and now you come out with these episodes. What's the change between making movies all the time? Because I know it's not only you. I see a lot of people right now. I don't know if it's a, it's a thing, but everybody is doing episodes nowadays. What is that shift from film to episodes? Um, I think it's just evolution. I think it's evolution. I got called by Pure Flix to do Steps of Faith as a series. Oh. So I didn't, um, I wasn't looking to do a series. They just called me and said, hey, Mike, we got an idea. What do you think about it? Don't shut us down yet. Let us tell you the idea. And then we wind up doing Steps of Faith as a series. And they, you know, we're, we're waiting on green light. We're close. We're, we're green. We're just waiting on the light for the second series. Okay. Is it, it what's the difference between doing series and just doing a full blown movie? You get time, longer time to develop the characters. You get you got one, two hour film to tell you who this character is, and on a series you might have a hundred episodes, mm-hmm. and people like that character, don't like that character. You think about uh, Good Times, Florida and James never changed. Mm-hmm. Uh, Fred Sanford, Fred never changed, mm-hmm. but we liked that character and who he was. So to go back to piggyback off a question you asked me was. Why do I use Mama Hall all the time? It was something John Wayne said. John Wayne says, if we like old Mo in a movie, why do I have to change his name? Why can't he just be old Mo in every movie? Every because movie. we like old Mo. So mm-hmm. I, Mama Hall represented what I thought. I'm, in my stories, I always want the person to have a best friend because I think that's a lost art. And I think there's always a voice of reason that we should have in our community. Mm-hmm. And I always wanted that to be Miss Hall, she's always been that voice of reason or that voice of wisdom coming into a story that I'm trying to tell to make something, to hit a point or to exclamate a point. or Because if you hear it from her, then you're thinking, oh, well, that's like my grandmama saying. Right, yeah. right. So which ones do you make more money off of? The episodes or the movie? Because in my mind, I would think the episodes. I got I got paid to do the episodes. So, oh, okay. Yes. So, yes, they, they definitely... They definitely have uh, made more, and they will make more over time. Yeah, because when I think about 50 Cents and how he's doing his shows, and I can't stand you, 50 Cents, because you take so long to bring out second season, third season, and stuff like that, and it needs to just come back to back to back for us viewers, so stop doing that, okay? Anyway, so what do you think about his shows? And before I get into that, oh, no, answer that one. I had, like, three questions at once. No, I you know, I think 50 is doing... Man, I, I love the work he's doing. I love the artistry he's doing. Uh, I think the stories that he's telling are are they 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 helped in the movement. Again, that's the Tyler Perry movement. You don't get a fifty cents before Tyler Perry. Mm-mm. You know what I mean? Before people said people, where our people got fed up. I don't think anybody else was fed up with Tyler. Mm-hmm. We were the ones that was had a problem with Tyler. Right. And so by having a problem with Tyler, we get the 50 senses of the world. We get the Ava DuVernay's of, uh, and we get the, just the plethora of, of directors, the Creed's and the mm-hmm. Ryan Krugler. We okay. get that, we get those guys coming out of that movement. Now we got Cedric the Entertainer. He's doing, uh, he's got a bunch of shows out. I didn't know you that. Know, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, he's got a uh, on bounce. He's got that the uh, Johnsons on bounce. He's mm-hmm. got you know his show the neighborhood, and then he's got another show that just came out. That girl, I think that's okay. what it's called on uh, bounce. So we got we got these guys developing and producing. Tasha's directing. You know what I mean. So we got a lot. Kim Fields is directing. So we got all these products from from that situation. Yeah. So why did you choose Pure Flix to put your film out when you have Netflix, you have um, Hulu, you have all these different platforms? So when I came out and I started doing the Mm faith-based movies, there weren't a lot of platforms that take those movies. And Pure Flix just happened to have God Is Not Dead blew them up. Mm -hmm. And they started their own, what they considered the, the Christian version of Netflix. Okay. So... Netflix was only picking up. If you understand the history of Netflix, Netflix broke its back off of independent filmmakers. Mm -hmm. Then they isolated the independent filmmakers. So to get on Netflix, you almost have to have what they consider, their guidelines are so strict. The camera you have to use, the writing, the actors. It's Mm. just, and then Pure Flix was like, hey, we're looking for content and we like what you're doing. 
And so that became a partnership with me along with TBN and Positive TV and uh, Tubi. Tubi. And oh, you're on Tubi as well? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, Amazon. Because mm-hmm. uh, I always just go to Pure Flix to find your films. Yeah, you can find them anywhere. You can find on them Tubi. on Amazon, YouTube. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you know they, they're screening right now on Byron Allen's network. They're screening wow. on uh, <coughs> on um, TBN. They're screening on Positive. They're screening on... So you put your film out to all these different platforms, or do they reach out to you to get their, your uh, film? I have, a, I have a distributor. Okay. Wow. Man, M. Legend Brown, man, we definitely appreciate you. Could you give me your top three um, movies of all times? Top three. Number top one. Top three of all time. This is your... Mine. Uh, number one. Number one. Wow. I know I can't have any <laughs> dead space here. Oh, man. I've never really thought about it like that. I had some movies that were... Uh, Ten Could, Commandments has got to be one of them, man. That's okay. Just, okay. That's just brilliant. Uh, number two. John Singleton's... Uh, uh, Four Brothers. Mm. Wow. I just love the way he told that story. Which one of the Ten Commandments? Because you know if you pull up Ten Commandments, you have a million Ten Commandments. One with Charleston Hitson. Okay. Yeah. Uh, number and three. And number three would be Michael Mann's Heat. Wow. Why? Because <clears throat> just the way he told. It was so breathtaking, the way he told that, the way the characters jumped off the screen. It was like a phenomenon at the time I seen mm-hmm. it. And that's, that influ- he influenced me a lot. With filmmaking, you know what? I got to take that back. I got to take heat out of there, and I got to put "It's a Wonderful Life." <laughs> "It's a Wonderful Life" was a powerful movie for me because we've seen it. I watch it every Christmas religiously. Well, let me ask you something else. Um, <clears throat> if you could work with any actor, um, any actor or actress or actress, um, who would it be and why? Any actor. And then let me say this: I hate when people do that. I'm sorry. <laughs> actor and actress. Actor is a is a, is a performer. Right. It's not a gender. So mm. anyway, I uh, like that. Thank you so much. Thank you for clarifying that. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just so sick of every time a woman and a man come on here. It's a it it's a one up, and I think America's done that to our people, man. And yeah. we got to stop it. We got to change the narrative and be cool with just being who we are and, and accepting each other so much more. I think so. If, right. But if that's the case, why even come up with the name actress then? Who came up with that? The devil. No, you I'm know, just messing. With. We know it's, it's, it just becomes a gender thing because mm. that's who we are. Denzel Washington. Denzel Washington. Yeah, if I could work with Zell. It's up. It's over. Did you like Antoine Fisher? That was his first oh, movie director. Or he produced it or directed it? Directed. I don't know if it's the first directorial, though. Yeah, I think it was. You don't yeah. think so? I, I think they something. made a big deal out of that. They did, but I think it was something else, though. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think, well, more like plays, but yeah. Uh, no, yeah, Antoine Fisher was the movie, man. I studied that movie. I broke that movie down piece by piece by piece. And so, yeah, if I had to work, I almost had a chance to meet Zell. Really? He was out in L.A. at the at the Magic Johnson Theater. We would do, it was the, uh, oh, my goodness, it's the Black Film Festival that's out in L.A. every year. Oh, my goodness, I can't believe I can't think of it. So we go out to eat. We go to Roscoe's Waffles and Chicken. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And one of my friends in there, she's like, Mike, where you at? Where you at? Denzel's sitting in this room by himself, and nobody's in here. And where you at? I can get you in here right now. I was like, oh, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm halfway across town. I'll be like, hey. We were so far away, and he was getting ready to do the guest speaker. Okay. So I was like, oh, why did I go eat? Because <laughs> I was hungry. <laughs> It's kind of like when, and Mama Hall was there, so she got all the fluff. I met Bologna from Good Times, Miss, uh, why can't I think of her real name? Oh, my goodness. I'm like, you guys, I hate to call people, but that's what we grew up as. Right, as exactly. Met Vanessa Bell Calloway. I met a bunch of people that night, but I really would have liked to met Zell. Mm-hmm. And I remember uh, just kicking myself in the head for that. I was like, ah, I could have met Zell. It's going to be, if it's men, it's going to come right back around again. Zell. Where my camera at? Right there. Zell, come work with me, baby. Man, Would you do any films that's not Christian-based? So, let me say this, because this is where I think another scenario is. I am a filmmaker who happens to be Christian. Mm-hmm. I'm not a Christian filmmaker. And what I mean by that is, 
no matter what film you give me and what film I do, my Christian beliefs will always be embedded in that film. So if you ask me to tell a story and it's a vampire killing a bunch of vampires, somewhere in there, my beliefs are going to be... <laughs> something I'm talking about God. <laughs> something in there. Some way he's going to be convicted and he's going to display some evidence of faith, belief, conviction. So that's who I am. I'm, I'm a Christian by into nature. Mm-hmm. I'm not a Christian filmmaker. So if you if you tell me if you give me a story, you're asking a Christian to tell a story, and he's gonna put his because everything is poured out of me. Right. So that's what I. This is the reason why I said that because the majority of your film seems to be that way. That's the reason why. Because when I moved home, I used to do dark films. Man, I used to have my camera guys, and they'd be like, "Oh, Michael, we're so tired of crying every time we do a film. Can we do something light and happy?" And I was like, "No, this is where we impact the world." I was on that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so I go home I move back home God moved me back home and I go home and I'm sitting there watching TV and my uncle and them are watching retro that was before we even knew what it was called it was called retro TV Hawaii Five O and Gunsmoke and on this one channel and I was like mm-hmm. what is this and then I went to research and it was one of the most popular stations in the Metroplex you from Terrell, Texas uh, Eric Bishop, a.k.a. Jamie Foxx, is from Terrell, Texas. Um, just want to know, you know, like when you look at him coming from the same area that you have been now filming in, a lot of your films are being filmed down there. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, his his street, Jamie Foxx Street, that they changed it to, that was, I think it was Bradshaw before mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Uh, at any rate, uh, when, you, when I say Jamie Foxx, what comes to mind? Very talented. Very talented individual. Not just actor, he's just very talented. And someone that I would love, Jamie, love to work with you, Mr. Bishop. After uh, he worked with Denzel, Jamie, I'm yeah. gonna say that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, you, you seen that, the boy yeah. right there, down yeah, there by yeah. your house, won't yeah, even yeah, act yeah. right. Yeah, 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 that's, that's us, man, you know us. <laughs> um, he's inspired, he's inspired. I think everybody from that community, and I think he inspires people all over the world by what he does. He's now going into the directing and producing side. Of okay. It. So to see, you know, to see him not just level out as an actor and a singer, but keep pushing and putting people on, and and you know, people are like, well, he's putting everybody else on. He's putting musicians on. Why, why he don't put you on? How do I? I'm like, say, man, God timing is God's timing. Do you think that uh, Terrell uh, shows him the respect? That, that he deserved because I remember one time there was an issue that they had uh, that, that, that some kind of tractor was on the newspaper and they put a big picture of the tractor and a small picture of Jamie Foxx and then the next thing you know there's billboards out by the highway to kind of compensate for what had happened. Um, do you think Terrell, Texas gives him the respect that he deserves as, a, as the biggest thing not only in Terrell, but the biggest thing in Texas and maybe the biggest thing, one of the biggest things that happens in California. I think they do now. They I had think to at get first, there, huh? Yeah, I think at first they didn't. And I benefit from some of that. Okay. I benefit from that in Obama when they didn't put Obama on the front page of the newspaper. So wow. I benefit from, I benefited when I first got to Terrell from some of that because I was, I was coming in a time when they were trying to save face and trying to, 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 um, Clean it up. Clean it up or, or just make it right. I okay. think they were trying to make it right. I know, I thought they, they probably, it was probably in hindsight, you know, we all make mistakes. We all make dumb decisions. We all make, and I'm saying that Terrell made a dumb decision. I'm just saying we all make decisions that we regret in the heat of the moment. And I think they they made a decision that they didn't know the grat- the magnitude of. And then when they started shutting down the newspaper and they, you know, people just wouldn't buy things. Then they go, oh, wow, this was, maybe this was bigger. We didn't know it was this big. You know, the man won an Oscar. I mean, I don't know what, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, you know, you, 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 I just think they just didn't see, they didn't give it the, they didn't know how big he was. I don't even know if they knew what he was doing. Yes, okay. You know what I mean? So they was just like, he's an actor. Okay, he's been on a bunch of shows. Okay, he's a musician. Okay, let's just put him in the paper. Isn't it amazing how on the Jamie Foxx show and everywhere that he get an opportunity to do on the stage in comedy, he always lift up Terrell, Texas. Yes. 
He won't, and, and we so quick to say, oh, we live in Dallas just because we live in Terrell. But this Jamie Foxx, a.k.a. Eric Bishop, is the type of guy that always would say Terrell, Texas. And I think that was real big for him because he could have just said Dallas. He could have. But he, he didn't. No. He said Terrell, Texas. No. And he said it not only once, he said it numerous over of times. And over and over again. And I think that that they realize now, and that's why they gave him the street, and that's why they're trying to do everything to reconcile that that um, that that that, that uh, mishap. Mishap. Yeah. Wow. So. Yeah, man. Well, I'm, I just want to say, man, thank you for coming I on have the show. One question. Uh, right? oh, oh, you got something else? Yeah, I have okay. one question left. Um, okay, being a filmmaker coming up, because I know most of your film that you've done. Of course, if you know Terrell, you know that that's where it's being filmed. And when you started coming up and wanting to film films in Terrell, knowing the type of place Terrell can be, um, what were the, what was the obstacles you had to go through? Because when, th- when I watch a film, I'm like, okay, that's under the bridge over there where that old restaurant used to be or that's on such and such. And I know when you're filming, sometimes you might need a road blocked off or you might need whatever. But Gotta have know, permits. And permits and stuff like that. And again, if you know Terrell, you know Terrell. And because of who you are, what are the obstacles you had to go through and how did you overcome them? Really, there was no obstacles. Really? Because I came... I was the beneficiary of Mr. Fox. Terrell gave me my own day. Mm. There's only two people who ever gave me my own day. Um, Fort Worth, um, Forest Hill. Uh, they gave me a day, proclamation. Wow. And Terrell gave me a proclamation. Terrell has always supported me. They've given me any resources I need. They've, they've like on the last shoot I did, we had the police, the fire department, and, and they paid their salaries. Mm. They've been. They gave me an office. So Terrell has been. You came the right time. Terrell has been very, very, um, and then they're now trying to become because of stuff that Jamie's doing and I've done. Now they're seeking to become a film friendly town mm. because now they understand the the power of what film does, right. and they're saying, "Hey, how do we become? And how do we become uh, 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 influence? And how do we help people?" And how do we become part of this society? But most of the people who watch your film will never know that it's filmed in Terrell unless you've been down there because it doesn't say anywhere on there. It does. At it the does? End? Yes. It's oh, I, did, I never read Credits. the end part. Yeah. And I'm trying to get Terrell to get, do like Georgia did. Let me put the Terrell logo on every film. Mm. Because as much as they do for me, I go in there and I say, hey, I, you know what? Could you buy me lunch one day? <laughs> All right, Mike, tell us what you want. Mm-hmm. You know, or can you help me with location or uh, hotels for my for my actors? How many you need, Mike? Wow, that's man. awesome! Thank you so much, man. Been a great show. I appreciate it, Mr. M. Legend Brown is man. in the house, man. Thank you so much. How can people get a hold of you if they're trying to reach out to, uh, you know, engage in in some of your projects, up and coming? How can they How can they reach you? As a famous woman said, just Google M. Legend Brown. <laughs> hey, man. You know what? I want to say this before I go. I like this. This is to me. I used to listen to Mama Hall always talk about, man, we sit in a room. I'd be in a room with Billy D, and we'd be in a room with Gizzy, Gizzy uh, and just different people, just say that. Artists, musicians, actors. When we first met, you know what I mean? Now to see where you guys are. Yeah. And to see how it's like the grind, and, and if you put in the time, you put in the work, you can do anything. Man. And to see people rising at the same time is beautiful. Man, you know, God you. don't make no mistakes. Oh. And it's already been written. So at the end of the day, I think uh, your gift will make room for you. Mm-hmm. It don't tell you how long it's going to take either. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. <laughs> it just say it'll make room for you. Yes. So I just thank God for you. And I just say keep on making those movies. Um, uh, that can change people's lives and hearts like you've been doing. And and we'll keep on watching. And I know I know that you've saved lives through those movies. Thank you. Thank I know you. that already. Thank you. And you got to re- know that. You don't have to see them. Mm-hmm. No. You oh. just have to know that the harvest is plentiful exactly. and the labels are few. That's it. That's it. And do what you're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. That's it. And quench not thy spirit. That's it. Check it, man. And Pure Flicks. 
you need to let this go for the, uh, episode two because I'm already done with episode <laughs> one of Steps of Faith. Um, step, <laughs> episode two need to come on with it because I can't wait this long, okay? Check it, man. Hey, man. We love you, brother. Thank you. It's been another great segment of Boss Talk 101, where the bosses talk. And we out. Boss Talk 101.